Welcome. I'm Jessica Bursky, NEMA's Senior Policy Analyst. Um, thank you for joining another NEMA Virtual Learning Lab. Um, this session is called Congregate Disaster Housing and Shelters During a Pandemic and in a Post-COVID World presented by Harbor Industries. And our moderator, John Barry, is no stranger to this topic. Um, he is Harbor Industries Product Director for Wellness and Emergency Response. Um, he was part of the team that developed the Rapid Deployment Modular Rooms System designed to help emergency response planners manage the sheltering of disaster survivors, as well as first responders. Uh, John also serves as an Army in, or as an officer in the Army National Guard and has led soldiers in response to several state emergencies, um, including floods and the COVID-19 pandemic. He also has created a very dynamic panel of varying disciplines to speak with us today and learn from their insights. So John, thank you. The time is yours. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's uh, really an honor for me to be leading the discussion today. Uh, like you said, each of our panelists is a truly distinguished professional in their fields and each have very unique uh, and experienced perspectives to bring to bear on the topic at hand, which is uh, congregate disaster housing and sheltering. So I'm just gonna dive right in with introductions. Uh, our first panelist uh, is Ryan Broughton. He's the Vice President of Emergency Management Solutions for Deployed Resources, a nation, which is a nationwide turnkey emergency logistics provider. Over the past 20 years, Ryan has served as Emergency Manager for the City and County of Denver, Colorado, the City of San Jose, California. He's also served as the Emergency Manager for the U.S. Army Worldwide, the U.S. Navy Worldwide. He's been a volunteer and paid first responder since 1988. Ryan is a certified emergency manager and a certified business continuity professional. Ryan, thank you so much uh, to you and Deploy Resources for your time today and joining us. Our next panelist, uh, Dr. Joe Hawley, is the medical director for the State of Tennessee Department of Emergency Medical Services, as well as the Memphis and Shelby County Fire Departments and several municipal and private ambulance services throughout the West Tennessee region. He's an associate professor in emergency man medicine for the University of Tennessee Health Science Center also. Dr. Holly has served on over 30 deployments, including Hurricane Katrina and the Pentagon on 9-11 as the medical director of Tennessee Task Force One Urban Search and Rescue. He served on the National FEMA Incident Support Team. He's a member of the board of directors of the Commission on Accreditation for Pre-Hospital Continuing Education, or CAPSI. Uh, the National Association of EMS Physicians and a Fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians. Dr. Holly is a board certified uh, emergency medicine practitioner and was among the first group of physicians in the nation to earn the designation of Fellow of the Academy of Emergency Medical Services. Dr. Holly, thank you so much for lending your expertise to this panel today. Uh, our next panelist uh, may be having some technical difficulties joining, so I'm hopeful that she will be able to join us but I will uh, provide an introduction. Sam Bradley is a semi-retired uh, after spending her professional career as a paramedic educator and as a, as a disaster responder. Sam has a master's degree in fire service and is the training officer of federal, for Federal Disaster Medical Assistance Team with several international and domestic deployments spanning her career. She is a journalist, a producer, and videographer, and for the last eight years, she has hosted the Disaster Podcast, which you can find online, as well as with your preferred podcast streaming service. And for our final panelist, uh, we have a special guest and longtime friend to NEMA to introduce uh, that individual. Uh, I'd like to introduce past NEMA president and current, current emergency management liaison to the Red Cross, Charlie English. Charlie, would you please introduce our next panelist. Thank you, John, and I really appreciate you allowing me to uh, introduce my friend and colleague Alex Rose to the group. He's, he's new to NEMA, and so that's why I wanted to uh, be able to introduce him. And uh, when, when you had uh, asked, asked me to uh, think about a, a congregate, non-congregate shelter expert in the COVID environment, the first person that came to my mind was Alex. And uh, I said, you know, he would be perfect if I can get him. 
And so I called Alex and he, he was glad to, uh, to join us today and uh, his schedule allowed it. And, you know, rather than going through a lot of the, his accomplishments is hundreds of house fires, uh, scores of large disasters he's deployed to. You know, the thing that's impressed me so much with Alex, true humanitarian at heart, loves people. He, he doesn't sit in his ivory tower at national headquarters with his strategy documents uh, and just uh, throwing those things out. He rolls his sleeves up, deploys, and is often looked to to be the person that solves problems uh, in, in some of our biggest disasters that, that we've had. So uh, with that, thank you, John. Thank you, Alex, for joining us. And I'll turn it back to you, John. Thanks a lot, Charlie. And Alex, uh, it really is a pleasure. We're very happy to have you and uh, your experience as well as uh, the Red Cross uh, here with us today as part of the panel. So thank you very much. So before we begin, I'd like to just reiterate the outline for today's discussion. Uh, our goal uh, for, is for this to be as truly interactive as we can make it uh, in, in this environment. So with that, uh, I'm really excited to kick it off. So panelists, uh, the first question I'm going to pose to each of you individually is, is what are one of the biggest concerns about congregate housing and sheltering in the immediate future? And, and I'll kick it off with just my impression from the perspective of, you know, of a, you know, someone who leads individuals in response to events in the National Guard. One of the things that we constantly struggle with, even, in, even when there isn't a pandemic, is, is forced health, force health protection. Right. So, in, it, you know, for a large scale response, we could have uh, scores to hundreds to sometimes even thousands of individuals on the ground and crammed into, you know, crammed into any space that's available. And one of the things that is consistent, regardless of what time of year it is, is cold and flu. And we can lose any, anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of our uh, of our available uh, manpower resources for you know, one to several days just because of the common cold or the common flu. And so you know, we look, we're constantly looking for ways to, to maximize the spaces that we have available, not only to, to, so that we can make sure that we can fit everybody in, but also just to keep everybody as safe as possible. So that's one of the issues that we see, uh, that I see as a leader, uh, you know, just trying to keep my people safe. Uh, Joe, what, what about you? Well, you, you, thanks, John. You certainly touched on the big elephant in the room, which is, uh, you know, the pandemic stuff. And I think that's the biggest challenge I see is how do we deal with uh, the safety of uh, either survivors or responders who need to be sheltered in an austere environment, uh, provide for uh, social distancing and uh, cleanliness issues, hygiene issues, et cetera. Um, for both those groups with very different needs uh, and be able to do so in such a way as to keep everyone safe. Uh, I, I think part of this really has to do with, particularly related to the pandemic and the, the monstrously difficult and expensive challenge of dealing with either an exposure or someone who uh, becomes symptomatic during a, a, an event and trying to take care of them in an austere environment and do they need to be uh, isolated from the rest of the group? Do they need to be sent home? Do, how do we do that? The challenges uh, of transportation of somebody in a, in a situation like that. So it, it really has not only the, the short-term issues, but very long-term repercussions to it as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Ryan, what about you from your position with deployed resources and the work that you guys do? What do you see? What are your biggest concerns about congregate housing and sheltering? I think the, the biggest concern that I'm seeing and I'm seeing it grow every single day is our overall lack of both local and national capacity. We don't have enough um, congregate sheltering, especially when we get into the wraparound services like feeding, watering, uh, uh, ablution services like toilets and, and showers. 
we just don't have enough capacity for for everybody to want it at the same time. Um, so that capacity is going to take a long time to develop. Uh, it's something that is that requires a lot of strategic investment. Uh, some companies have done that, but when you try to do it all at the same time, say vaccination points of dispensing with medical testing, with a crisis at the uh, southern border, and uh, things like winter storm Uri or hurricanes or earthquakes or tsunamis, uh, that's that really stretches the national capacity beyond its its uh, normal um, normal comfortable level. Uh, we we get to there's one toilet left, <laughs> there's one shower left, and that becomes a real limiting factor in being able to provide services to the uh, responders. All right. Alex, what about you? You know, what, are, what, is, what is the Red Cross seeing and, and what are your, some of your biggest concerns about congregate housing and sheltering, you know, coming into, you know, we're coming up on uh, tornado season and flood season. Uh, what are you guys seeing? Yeah, ab absolutely. And, you know, as we speak, there's, um, you know, precedent level flooding still in Kentucky. Um, and, and we've since transitioned all of our clients into non-congregate shelters, but um, within the state, you know, there, there had been the operation of congregate shelters. Um, so it's a really important question. I appreciate the opportunity to, to share my perspective, which is informed by my role with the Red Cross. Um, when we're providing congregate sheltering, we're doing it because we're striving to meet the immediate disaster cause needs of, of the people that have been affected by that disaster. Um, so if I'm going to list my biggest concern, it, it's probably that we're delivering this service in a way that ensures the dignity of the people that we're serving and, and that we're delivering the service of sheltering by qualified trained responders. And so this, this is really building up on top of what Joe and, and Ryan have already spoken to. You know, it, it's, it's not just having enough of the human resources, um, but, but also to, to deliver it effectively. Um, when we're operating in the COVID-19 environment, you know, as Joe said, you know, having enough facility space so that clients um, can have, you know, for us, the, our standard is 110 square feet uh, per person. Um, having enough hand washing stations, all, all those material supplies, um, but then also the ability to, to separately screen our clients, to isolate those who have symptoms. Um, and then finally, going back to why, you know, why we're providing sheltering in the first place, um, generally, people need help beyond just a safe location uh, to, to sleep and to eat. Um, there, there's many types of supportive services that, that the people that we're serving are going to need. Um, and, and so the biggest concern is, is really being able to mobilize that and coordinate that um, so that ultimately we, we can help those that we're serving move forward in their recovery and, and ultimately transition from that congregate shelter to a more sustainable location. You're muted. I knew it was gonna happen eventually, thanks. Uh, we've had our first question pop up in the chat and that question is, how can we accommodate mask wearers versus non-mask wearers, vaccinated versus non-vaccinated? Obviously that's that's a targeted question at the current, uh, the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Dr. Joe, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you, uh, I'm gonna let you tackle that one first. What, so the question is, how do we accommodate mask wearers versus non-mask wearers, vaccinated versus non-vaccinated? What, what does that need to look like from a medical perspective to be effective? Wow, so a really challenging question. And I think one that has, you know, is a bit of a moving target. Obviously, as we get more vaccinated folks out there, um, these issues will become less and less concerning uh, as we go forward. Uh, I, I think to some extent, you know, the, the, the challenge with those that do not wish to wear a mask uh, becomes very difficult in that they literally need to be in outdoor spaces more than six feet apart from everyone else, um, which sort of negates the term sheltering because uh, they really need to be outside uh, for their own and others' protection. Um, I think to some extent sheltering really has to um, uh put at the forefront safety of all those involved, which may well mean um, that everyone inside the shelter has to wear masks. Um, the vaccination uh, issue is gonna help reduce the need for that, I think over time, but I think for at least the next several months, 
Um, we're clearly going to have to deal with both of these issues as vaccinations are, you know, not yet where we need them to be to offer offer full protection for everyone. Uh, so, it, again, we're just in that we're in that time frame where it's going to be a bit of a moving target for the, the next probably six months at least. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Uh, Ryan, you had uh, you had some thoughts on this one as well. Well, it's, it's a problem that we face uh, since we work across multiple states and, and different events. Um, there's a couple solutions. One is subdividing structures. So something that uh, you and Harbor uh, Industries and I have talked about is, okay, how do we subdivide the structure so that we can um, keep people together, but we can use the available space more effectively? Um, the other is subdividing uh, the facility itself to people who are um, non-mask wearers versus mask wearers. Uh, the other is supplies, making sure that as a facility provider, we want to make sure that those supplies are available. So providing masks and having stated policies. Again, we're a little different than the Red Cross in that we run predominantly responder support camps. So uh, or uh, migrant facilities. And in both cases, we're, we're dictating what those terms are of occupancy. Uh, a little harder in the, the uh, disaster survivor uh, realm than it is in the responder realm. So well, Alex? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in to say, you know, every single Red Cross shelter has rules. Um, you know, we turn the lights on at a certain time, you know, we serve meals at a certain time, and we post that. And, and um, we expect that that people that can wear a mask will wear a mask. And, and all of our guidance is aligned with the CDCs. You know, the CDC has not changed, you know, in, in a congregate setting, you would be wearing a mask. Um, you know, it, um, we, we could probably spend this entire panel, you know, what ifing this, but I'll, but I'll tell you that, um, you know, we, we see in the media that, that there are many ardent you know, firm non-mask wearers that are protesting, that they have not been at our Red Cross shelters. Generally, people that are seeking help during a time of emergency are very understanding. When, when you come and explain why it's important and you offer, as, you know, as Ryan said, you, you offer what, what we want them to have. Um, and, and ultimately, this is for their safety and our own. Um, so, I mean, it, uh, we, it, 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 it's a hot button conversation, uh, but ultimately, you know, generally people are, are very understanding and compliant. Yeah, and so it's interesting, and I don't want to I don't want to belabor this too much, you know. But there are there are other cultures in the world where where wearing masks has been normalized for decades, right? Like what you know, uh, I I spent a good deal of my professional career in Asia, and uh, it, it was normal. If you you know during flu season, whether you were sick or whether you were trying to avoid getting sick, uh, you know people wore masks on you know both public transportation and when people were outside. So you know I I personally and you know professionally am hopeful, and, and for all of us I'm hopeful that you know eventually this will be a, a normalized this you know wearing a mask to protect yourself and protect others during you know whether it's during flu season or during a pandemic that this you know that we, we will normalize and. We're, we're going through some growing pains, but I think, you know, to everyone's point right now, it's, you know, it's complicated. And Alex, you know, from the Red Cross's perspective, yeah, yeah, I think you, I think you need to set rules, right? So. And, and, and I mean, we, 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 we will make exceptions, you know, if, if, if a hurricane is bearing down and someone is that firmly, you know, coughing on everyone, you know, as a political statement, um, and, we're probably not going to kick them out. We're going to find a separate space for them to, to exercise whatever um, position that they have, but, but really ensure that everyone else is being safe. And at this point, this isn't about masks. This, this is about, you know, rules, uh, you know, and, and people understanding that in order for us to provide a service, you know, they, they can't put other people in harm's way. And so as, as soon as it is safe, ultimately for them to, to have another place to be, we're going to make sure that they're, they're not putting our clients in a harm's way. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thanks, Alex. So I'm going to, uh, there's another question here. I'm debating whether or not to shift it a little bit later, but I'm going to go ahead and address it now. So the question from the, uh, the question from the audience is, so what is needed? What steps need to be taken to increase sheltering capacity, especially down at the local level? 
Ryan, you want to field that one first? Well, it's a one of the biggest issues that I saw as, a, as an emergency manager is this feeling that, and I've heard police say it, I've heard firefighters say it, I've heard other emergency managers say it. Uh, Charlie English and I have had this discussion before uh, a couple times that, uh, well, Red Cross has got it. <laughs> and there is a lack of ownership and taking responsibility by the emergency managers at the county level and, and the city, but at the county level where, where the responsibility lies to provide mass care services. And that is not just a Red Cross action. To me, it is a whole of community action. Um, we as a community need to look at pu uh, public solutions, private solutions, non-governmental solutions, um, down to even families taking care of families. Um, there, there is a critical lack of willingness to talk about what happens to people who are displaced. And there's almost a complete blind spot, except in hurricane country, but that's because they have practice with it. Um, there's a blind spot about what all these responders, all the utility workers, all the private sector employees that have to come in after an emergency, uh, I cannot tell you how many times we're faced with the same question. Well, I didn't know all these people that were going to do debris management and damage assessment and post-emergency care. They, they needed a place to stay? Well, of course they do. You would, therefore they do. So we have to really look at that whole community. Uh, the answer is not always just put them in hotel rooms. That's just not going to work, especially as we get a vaccinated populace and we start filling up those hotel rooms again. Um, we've got to look at a broader selection and it cannot just be, oh, we'll use a public school gym and the Red Cross. Um, we've got to build that capacity at the local level. And then at the national level, we have to do some strategic investment. And we're starting to see that from FEMA where they're starting to say, well, we probably need a contractor to manage this, but we need to actually invest in building it because a company like Deployed Resources, we have to maintain hundreds of toilets and trailers and uh, showers and laundries and kitchens. And well, that's all good, but it needs to be used on a routine basis. And otherwise we're bearing that cost, which means that cost gets passed on during a hurricane or a earthquake. So we need that strategic investment to say, we need that capacity. Something that you and I've seen in the military is we always have that stuff just standing by, yeah. but we don't have the stuff standing by for the responders and for the displaced personnel um, in that congregate shelter for anything larger than a relatively localized, maybe regional um, emergency. Once you get to national, once you get to large regions like all of Texas, we're nowhere near capacity level. Yeah, you know, I mean, you and I've had this, this is a discussion that you and I've had, Ryan, and, you know, from Harvard's perspective, it's the same, right? Like you, you right now, you know, even in, from my experience in the military, you know, what I see any, anytime there's a disaster, and you're right, you know, we have, we have a lot of resources standing by uh, waiting to be used, but it, it seems to me like every time that there's, you know, anytime that there's a flood down at the local level, there's this mad dash for resources, like, like it's some big, like it's a big surprise. You know, and you know, the, it floods in this, it floods in the Boot Hill, Missouri, and in the Northwest Missouri, pretty much every year, like clockwork. You know, but but every time, it's just like it's the, almost like it's the first time. And so, yeah, I, I think that, and I'm glad to see that FEMA is starting to is starting to shift the, the gears of thinking toward more strategic investments uh, in, in resources. And that kind of leads me into this next question: is, is from the from the audiences. So what does sheltering look like at the local level uh, using churches, using colleges, et cetera? And, you know, as a moderator, I don't want to take up all the time, but, you know, that's going to be, that's going to look different from my perspective uh, as, you know, as a responder, that's going to look different for, for every environment, right? So, you know, there might, you know, you might have an event at a, at a location or in an area where there isn't a church large enough to, to house the number of survivors or displaced persons, but there might be, but there might be a, a football field or a sporting field that's within a safe distance of a, you know, that's within a safe, uh, with, within a safe distance of a, uh, of an event where you could put up, you know, where you could put up some type of, uh, of tented structure or something like that. So I think it's going to look differently at every, at every locale. 
but that those things should be identified ahead of time. So, but we should keep in mind. I think Alex should should compliment, uh, you know, uh, provide his perspective from the Red Cross level. But we we've got to stop saying that we're going to keep using schools once schools are back in session. That's not always the option. You can't keep saying you're going to use universities because universities have requirements to take care of their people. Ever since Virginia Tech, we have laws, we have regulations that require those universities and colleges to take care of their own people so they can't take care of uh, others. Um, anything that is revenue generating, like a sports center, a uh, field, a uh, special event center, um, is not on your list until you have unlimited money through public assistance. You can't afford it and you're taking away revenue at the local level. Parks are not good. You need hard surfaces to bed down. Otherwise you end up having people walk through the mud everywhere they go. So some of the traditional ideas, oh, we're gonna use schools, universities, uh, you know, the, 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 the football field, not good answers for shelter capacity, especially when you need to subdivide that capacity or use it, you know, use as I think Alex said, 110 square feet per person instead of 60, you need, you need room to, to lay down. Alex, your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I really appreciate um, getting to follow, you know, you who, you know, was a county emergency manager. I mean, people need to hear their county emergency manager acknowledging and investing in, you um, building a solution that must be sustained. And so, you know, um, many agencies can build short-term capability uh, by rapidly training people before disaster season and then not thinking about it for nine months. That, 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 that ultimately is not a good plan. And so, I mean, what we see behind your shoulder, you know, th there's a planning process. Um, it, and it's important that, you know, I mean, these are things that we all hear, but we actually need to do it bring the different agencies together, make sure we know who's accountable, uh, make sure that our, you know, at the local level that our, our elected officials are invested in the solution. I mean, I'm, I'm not the expert when it comes to, um, you know, uh, getting all the right people together, but, but ultimately, you know, it will, it requires a significant number of trained human resources in order to deliver the service. And it's not hard and it's actually really meaningful and a special thing to be someone in your own community that does this. And, you know, whether it's CERT members or um, auxiliary police volunteers, I mean, there, there, there is already um, a pool in almost all um, communities, if you don't have this capability yet, um, of people that care a lot about their community and, and may be eager to be cross-trained. Um, so that so that's one of the strategies, um, but but ultimately it requires investment to sustain a volunteer workforce and to keep them up to date and you know just the care and the feeding and the appreciation. Nothing is free, um, and, and and that has to happen between disasters. When it comes to um, site selection, you know you know um, ultimately someone will decide. Let's plan for X percent of our population, and we can do some math. You know. In a pre-pandemic time, you know, Red Cross will be planning for 60 square feet per person. If we're trying to shelter, you know, have the capability for 10,000 people, that, that's a lot of facilities. And in some jurisdictions, you know, schools are off limits. In other jurisdictions, you know, schools will be the, the primary site, you know, maybe for the first X many days. Um, but those are things that we need to plan for. Um, and then I, I really want to underscore uh, that, that we really should be planning to serve uh, people that have function and access needs. We should not be making assumptions that everyone we're serving speaks the language that we're having this, this webinar in, or that everyone will be able to, to walk on their own to get to where they're going, or that they will have transportation to get there. That, that's a critical part of the planning process. Um, and it's, it's actually pretty simple to build capability on paper and put it in a, in a notebook on our shelf. Um, and, you know, and probably, you know, contractors are making a lot of money doing that, but, but that is not ultimately serving the communities that we all live in. And um, it, I, I would just encourage anyone that's asking a question like this, um, it doesn't have to be the American Red Cross, but, but get in touch with one of the, the nonprofits that is, is doing this not for, for money, but, but for 
for the support of their community and, and, and ask them what they've done, what they've learned. Um, Cause I, I think that there's a lot of insights that ultimately um, we, we need our government officials that are, are driving this and ultimately accountable for this um, to understand those lessons. Thanks a lot, Alex, Ryan, uh, you as well. I'd like to, I'd like to shift gears and I do see guys, I do see a lot of the questions coming in, in the chat. Uh, and we will, we will get to those, I do promise. But I do want to, I do want to shift gears slightly. So, uh, Dr. Joe, this is a question for you. You know, it's been mentioned uh, that future congregate shelter scenarios will need to consider infectious disease control as part of the planning implementation process. What does that look like to you from an emergency medical perspective, emergency medical management perspective? Well, I think it actually touches on many of the things we were just talking about. You know, I, I, I think part of the issue with, with sheltering in many cases is some of the assumptions that you mentioned earlier, where we'll put people in hotels. Uh, and, you know, at, at the same time, though, we have responders flowing into the area who also need sheltering. Uh, and we can't necessarily serve both purposes with the same concept. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time in tents and parking lots so that we don't take up hotel space for those that are uh, escaping from the, the, the natural disaster or whatever that they've been part of. But, but I think even beyond that, if you look at the issues associated with uh, sort of the, the more medically based pieces of that, and, and you think about many of those in our society that are um, dependent on home medical care, home medical equipment, uh, oxygen generators, for example, um, or uh, lift assist devices, or, you know, on more extreme levels, home ventilators and all that sort of stuff. And, and you, you look at the need to shelter those people. Part of the challenge there is this sort of conundrum between, um, you know, a, a pre-planned event or a predictable event like a hurricane is coming and we need to evacuate those people versus a, a no notice event where there is no opportunity for pre-movement of folks. But those who have, uh, those in our society that are most fragile and most dependent upon many of these additional uh, home medical equipment needs become very, very challenging to deal with in this environment from the standpoint of if they're not moved very early, they're often the very last ones to be moved because they are moving them is technically difficult uh, and requires lots of logistics to, to get that done. And, and then they can't sort of go anywhere. You have to have a shelter that has the capability of uh, generating electricity to run their machine or uh, the ability to resupply oxygen or uh, a numerous other things that those folks may need. So, you know, the, the planning becomes very deep, as Alex touched on a few minutes ago, about the need to uh, prepare not just for the, the walking wounded, those that, that just need a place to stay, but those that need a place to stay and be taken care of in that environment. And that leads to a whole different set of challenges. Yeah, thanks a lot, Joe. You know, I like it as far, from the planning perspective, and this is somewhat lighthearted reference, but you know, the, for those of you that have ever watched Parks and Recreation, there's, a, there's an episode that tackles this issue um, from a somewhat comedic point of view. But, but at the same time, you know, honestly, I've sat in some meetings like that, Ryan, I'm sure you have as well. And, and Joe, I, I bet you have, and Alex as well, you know, those, those wargaming type scenarios, the scenario based trainings, that, that's pretty much kind of what they're like, you know? Uh, and, and the only way I think that, you know, from, again, you know, looking at from the National Guard perspective, I know for a fact that we don't, we are not actively engaged at the level that we could be in the communities that are regularly affected by uh, by, by these events, you know, floods, you know, flooding, especially in Missouri is, is the big issue, the big regular issue. We're not engaged down at that local level on a regular basis, other than when there's an event, you know, as part of that planning process, which we could be. And so to your point, Alex, and, and everybody else, you know, 
getting with those organizations that are going to be part of that solution and part of that response, whether locally or regionally, or even at the state level, I mean, it, it's critical and it's going to, it's ultimately what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to allow for a better quality of service to, to the individuals who are surviving these events, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of my perspective from where I sit. Uh, anybody have anything else they want to add? Uh, I'll throw in on that, John. It, it, it's not only that, it is significantly more expensive to take care of this stuff on the back end than it is on the front end, both in time, resources, and money. Uh, and while I appreciate that uh, politician and government entities are concerned about spending dollars, especially uh, dollars for preventative type stuff or something that may not happen for many years, um, the cost of taking care of things afterwards that had not been dealt with before is astronomically more expensive. Uh, and so it, it really is money well spent on the planning process. Which to Ryan's point earlier, you know, with FEMA taking, you know, FEMA starting to turn the eye more toward, uh, more toward strategic, uh, strategic planning and strategic thinking, you know, I think that that's going to, I'm hopeful and optimistic that that's going to start shifting and, you know, in the future. So we have that to look forward to. Uh, Alex, I'd like to point a question to you, if that's all right. Uh, and I'm gonna make this, I think I can, I think I can make this into a two-parter and capture one of the questions from the, uh, from the chat. So uh, from the disaster relief organization point of view, the Red Cross, uh, what operating standards do you see that are important now as ways to ensure the safety of your clients as well as your staff. I know we've touched on some of this, but let's just kind of dig into that a little deeper. Yeah, no, it's it's a great question, and um, I mean, as an organization, we're we're um, we're proud and confident in in what we established. You know, starting say last January through you know this time or, or April of last year, in terms of revising our standards and. Um, as an organization, you know, standards and procedures are, are very important for us so that we, because uh, we strive to operate consistently across the country and, and we have workforce that are, you know, trained in, in one part of the country that, that may travel to the other for a national size disaster. So um, keeping shelter residents and our workforce safe in a shelter during COVID ultimately requires some adjustments to, to our, our standard training. Um, and, I, and my hunch is, um, amongst the, the NEMA members, you know, a percentage of you um, may have started as volunteers with the Red Cross and, and learned, you know, one of the first classes you took was sheltering. But, you know, what you learned then was different than how we're training people now. And so from a, a standards perspective, you know, the first I'll highlight is, is maintaining physical separation and social distancing. So, um, you know, establishing, you know, if there's a congregate shelter, an entirely separate area where the screening is occurring. And if, if people need isolation, you know, there, there must be a physical separation again. So really three separate physical locations for screening, um, for the isolation, and then for the dormitory. Um, we're, when we set up an isolation care area, you know, we, we're not gonna open the doors to the public if possible and, until that, that isolation care area is set up. And, and we have, you know, three standard questions and you don't need to be a licensed nurse to, to screen someone, but, you know, you do need to, to know the, the proper way to wear PPE um, to, to be closer than you might otherwise be in a dormitory setting to, to ask those questions when we do our screening. Um, we, we're doing ongoing health screening of our clients and of our workers. So, Again, you know, this isn't complicated, but we, we need standards that, that will allow us to prioritize that those activities are happening. Um, things as simple as like serving meals, you know, we're, we're doing all of that as individually packaged meals that are, are prepared off site um, because that, that just makes it easier for us and um, certainly safer for, for the people that we're serving. Uh, when we're serving meals or really serving uh, any item, you know, if, if someone needed a, you know, a, a toothbrush, you know, we're going to um, set up our, our serving area where we can maintain six feet distance and we're going to set it down and step back 
um, and then and then invite that person to come up. And um, you know, I think many of us uh, have been keeping ourselves safe. You know, during this pandemic, you know, wearing masks, going to the supermarket, being closer than than six feet to people in passing. But when we're operating uh, congregate shelters. Uh, we, we really are going out of our way uh, as, as, as a workforce to model the behavior that, that we want everyone to understand. Um, you know, just a few, few other standards that, that we've established, you know, maintaining heightened sanitization, um, limiting the number of, of visitors, um, and, and also recognizing that um, when we're setting up a congregate shelter, that is not our preferred sheltering approach. It, it's non-congregate shelter whether it's hotels or campsites or, or any other place where, where there can be separate living spaces. Uh, that's not always possible. Certainly when, when there's a, a tropical storm evacuation, um, you know, we're, 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 not, we're not starting with non-congregate, but um, ultimately, you know, when we get past an evacuation shelter and we're getting into post-impact, um, we're gonna immediately work to transition that congregate shelter and the entire population to, to a safer location. And if it's not possible, um, what we're striving to do is have every single congregate shelter have 50 or fewer clients and everyone is 110 feet apart. And so ultimately that means a lot of different sites and a lot of workforce. And, and that, that, that's an overhead that, you know, um, if there's one national level size disaster may be possible, but it certainly um, isn't inexpensive. But if there are four or five or six, it, it's getting very, very challenging and complex. And so uh, there, there isn't a simple answer to, to how you can sustain that, um, but it, it underscores the importance of um, planning and coordination with our counties and with our states and the federal government. Um, and, and ultimately, the, the resources all being coordinated so, so that um, we can meet the needs of people and we can operate using standards that, that keep those that we're serving and our own workforce safe. So that actually, Alex, uh, you kind of led into the next part of the question there is, does the Red Cross have the staffing capacity at the moment that it needs? And if not, I, I, who fills the gap? Yeah, so I'm, I'm pausing because there, there's um, messengers in our organization that I think could, could, could respond beautifully. And I'll probably trip on myself as I answer. Uh, but, you know, we're as a volunteer-led organization, we're we're always working to engage more of the community. Um, and if uh, there were, you know, three Hurricane Harveys at the same time, absolutely, we would not be able to serve everyone that needed help on our own. Um, you know, I, I think it, as an organization, it became very clear to us during Hurricane Katrina. Um, you know that that we needed to change how we approached mobilizing the community. Um, being being a partner with the community, um, you know, we we have special status as an organization. You know, we're a federal instrumentality. Um, you know, we we have a long history with the organization. We are unique in certain respects, but but we absolutely cannot um, serve every sheltering need that that our country has. And um, there's certain states and certain communities where where we are not the the primary leader. Um, or, or primary um, operator or even just support uh, for sheltering. And, and so I think it, it, it's important that, um, I mean, we, we bring tremendous expertise um, and our training is available and free for everybody and it's online and you know, separate from this meeting, you know, I, I can help connect those that don't know how, how to access that, you know, to, to know about the resources that we want everyone to at least be considering. Um, but, but that said, uh, the, it, it's vital that um, community leaders, you know, going back to that, that earlier question, um, take time to, to plan for the support that likely will be needed, if not, you know, next week or next year in the coming years, um, and, and look to other agencies, but, you know, bring us to the table too, because we have a lot to offer. So just, to, just, so just to plug your organization a little bit, Alex, so, so to, to, to the question, does the Red Cross have capacity to man everything, everything that's needed? I think the response is, is if, 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 you as a, if, if you as an entity or you as an individual on the, uh, on the meeting today, if you're interested in volunteering with the Red Cross, uh, 
reach, reach out to your local, reach out to your local Red Cross because they'd be more than happy to talk to you. That- yeah, I, I'd go a step further and, and say, you know, my hunch is nearly every single person here is a leader. And, and you know, it's not just that, that we need you, our country needs you. Um, and, and, you know, people like Charlie English, I think, can be a model to all of us, you know, to, to, to pivot from, from such an impactful career and then to share that um, with, with growing professionals, um, which the majority of whom are volunteers. It, it's a very special thing that all of us can do with, with a segment of our life um, that, that is really important for our country and, and you know, the, the future safety of all those that we care about. Ryan, what's, uh, what's your take? Well, I, I do want to comment on that from my past as a, a city and county emergency manager. Um, sh- mass care services is the responsibility of all of us. It's not the responsibility of any one organization to uh, take that whole burden. Um, and I would say that when you say who's responsible, who's that touch point, um, that's the local emergency manager, the city or county emergency manager who is supposed to be coordinating with many different providers of many different levels and needs, whether that is uh, with the hospitals, with the dialysis centers, because dialysis has to continue regardless of anything else, uh, with the 10% of our population that is electric or electronically dependent uh, for their life. All of those elements of coordination need to happen across the entire community, the whole community. And that's the county's responsibility or, or the city's responsibility. And the best thing that we can see in our states, since this is a NEMA webinar, is to look at uh, California's disaster service worker and volunteer program, DSW program. Because the ability to tap your public and private sector, especially that, that large public sector community, and allocate them towards mass care services, towards emergency logistics, towards transportation. Those are the three things that are always ranked lowest and they're always the weak ones because no one paid group has the leadership. Um, And we need to, to find ways to leverage everybody. So every single person from the librarian to the public works person, to the transportation, to the airport, to your health department, all need to be leveraged in an emergency. And they can't just be, oh, well, that's the EOC and the Red Cross. Oh, and and, and firefighters and police officers. But firefighters and police officers aren't there to take care of individuals. (laughs) They're there to take care of the public as a whole. We need to leverage these huge staffs. In in Denver, I had 14,000 staff. There are 15,000 total staff, including reservists with FEMA. For one county of, of 153 square miles, we had the same staff. And that doesn't even include the hospital and the public school system and the public library system. So I could for a line, maybe 29,000 people that are public sector employees to do that work. Well, that's how we meet the mass care challenges. It's not through saying Red Cross. And honestly, on a NEMA webinar, I'd say, I don't want you to volunteer with the Red Cross. I want you to fix this in your state. I want to fix this in your county. I want you to fix this in your your organization where you believe mass care, whether that's congregate or non-congregate or uh, mental health uh, counseling at the same time and feeding. I want you to think about, about mass care as your responsibility and then leverage volunteers and paid personnel to get that done. Thanks, Ryan. So, Ryan, I'd like to continue on a on a path uh, where I think you might have some where you might have some input. You know, it's we've we've kind of discussed. You know, what are the how do we how do we increase capacity? What are the types of places that we need to look to? You know, obviously, we talked about the fact that you know during the current environment, I, I just saw last night uh, in. in uh, in my state, 87% of the hotel capacity is, is available, 87%, right? That's there clearly a special circumstance uh, where there is that massive amount of availability right now. And, you know, Alex, you've mentioned that 
you, you know, your, your initial touch point for some of these, you know, for some of these uh, event responses is that congregate shelter, but, you know, is that congregate shelter to provide those initial services, but to move that, you know, to move folks beyond into, into some type of, of individual or family uh, sheltering situation, temporary or otherwise. And so, but, but thinking about that immediate response, and the need for congregate sheltering and, and, and uh, the need to put responders on the ground in a particular space for a particular period of time. Ryan, what types of, what types of, of structures or places are you looking at when you are, you know, when you're, uh, when you are consulting with, with communities or organizations, what, what are you looking for? So responder support camps uh, obviously is a little different than Alex's uh, comments about Red Cross. Um, our, though we support survivors, usually with wraparound services, we provide off-grid city for responders. Um, uh, we, can, we can host 20,000 responders nationwide with our own organic cap uh, capability, and we can set up camps within 72 hours in most places within continental United States, 72 hours, you can have a 500 person camp within 96 hours, you have a 1500 to 2000 person camp. Divide that in half, by the way, for capacity because of COVID. So you, 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 you see what I mean when I keep saying capacity, we can take care of 20,000 people. Now it's uh, COVID, we can take care of 10,000. So that's, that's the capacity challenge we have. I think one big emphasis that, that I would say the people on this webinar should take away is the importance of community preparedness. Um, I, I grew up in Texas, uh, had a nice winter storm in Austin back in the 80s. And you know what everybody said then, including the, the hand-typed after action report? We should work on winterizing our power grid and preparing the community. Well, that was 1986. I was a freshman and I could have literally taken that and copied it and said, same, see after action report, you know, from 20 years ago, 40 years ago. So uh, I, I think it's very important that the more community preparedness we have uh, from the community members as a whole, whether that's non-governmental, faith-based, community-based, or the individual and the family unit, uh, the less demand we're going to have. On the responder side, um, you know, I've mentioned subdivided structures being an important thing, and, and especially FEMA has come out with a lot of, and the states have come out with a lot of hard-sided structure requirements, which sound good, except that all the hard-sided structures are gone. <laughs> Get, uh, with, with everybody else spreading out, um, we just don't have a lot of those hard-sided structures like traditional mobile homes um, trust me, you don't want to use, uh, you know, travel trailers if you can avoid it. It is a, it's a, a long-term disaster within a disaster to do that. Um, Massachusetts has some great lessons learned from the Andover um, and Merrimack Valley uh, gas, uh, gas explosion. Um, things that we've learned that, that I want to, I guess, share with you is staggered feeding. We used to use you know, a food service bar um, with everybody coming into the food service at the same time. We've got to get used to in the pandemic uh, era, staggered feeding. And as Alex mentioned, feeding from offsite box lunches. But if you want to keep the calorie count and meet all the requirements, you're going to have to do staggered feeding. And somebody's going to have to serve up the food, put it on a plate form and transfer that to the, uh, the responder. That takes more staffing and it takes more time and it takes more square footage than the traditional uh, ways. Uh, technology integration. Um, you know, uh, Alex mentioned about registration. Well, how do you register everybody? How do you track everybody? Not only for the purposes of their safety, their security access control, but then the issues that Joe, uh, Dr. Holly mentioned, which were testing, tracing, public health issues. How remember that you're in many cases required to do the contact tracing within that environment. So you have 1,500, 2,000 responders coming and going, working for 18, 20, 08, in one case, 48 different organizations who all have their own reporting chain of command 
and then tracing across all that group um, and providing public health is, is a staggering um, responsibility. Another issue that we saw is the increased training and the increased logistical burden for janitorial and cleaning. Waste management. One of the best ways to test for COVID is in wastewater, preferably black water. Um, but we now have people that are dealing with that wastewater. All of our facilities, for example, are off grid. We, we set up and we bring in everything. So we're moving wastewater, we're moving water in, we're providing power, we're providing janitorial cleaning, uh, you know, down to fluff and fold uh, laundry service. So all of those people now have to be trained at another level that they just traditionally haven't been. And then we need to maintain that staff, as Alex was talking about, before the emergency, as Joe talked about, before the emergency, we have to get all those people ready and we have to be able to activate them within 48 hours to have a place up and running in 72. And we have to do that across all of the states. So there is a big gap. There are states that don't even have advanced readiness contracts with one of the providers. I'm just one of five of the national logistics contractors, but you need a contract. You need to tell those people what you need so they can start building that local environment to support you when they're, they're called upon. Um, the off-grid piece is becoming harder and harder. Um, power, utilities are something we're used to. The big issue is comms, communications, 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 right? Numbers one, two, and three in every after-action report ever written by man. Um, and then network. It is amazing how if we want to do all this technology integration, we need Wi-Fi. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, now underly the underlying thing is Wi-Fi. Everything else is, is, is secondary to, do you have a network? And building mesh networks out of nothing is, well, again, a very big challenge that, that we need to take an approach. And we need to include that in the contracting side. We need to include that in the planning side. I cannot tell you how many times ADA toilets are not mentioned, ADA showers aren't mentioned, and Wi-Fi isn't mentioned. Those are the three things that just nobody ever thinks to write in the requirement, the mission. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll leave with is again, disaster service workers. Um, when you call a company like Deployed Resources, we show up with our people. They're paid staff, they have to be trained to certain levels, they have to be certified in many cases. Um, you want security, they have to have licenses. All of that costs a lot of money. You want something to just be deployed in a moment's notice. Uh, Jackson State University in Mississippi is a perfect example. Um, we have a yard in Jackson and Mississippi called for help. We provide it. But I, I'm always reminded about my lessons in California as a city emergency manager that you need to have a bigger workforce. Once they ran out of money and they, had just, they, they hadn't re reached that threshold for public assistance until last Thursday, when they reached that money threshold where they just couldn't afford it anymore, the capability went away. And we need to create more capacity in our environment for uh, carrying on those missions or supporting those missions, whether with military, which, yeah, it's just one more thing the military gets to do, or with a larger public sector uh, staff that you have, we just don't employ very well. So though I'm not trying to put myself out of business, I, I would say that that's something that we see universally. Um, people don't know how to leverage their public sector staff and their community-based organizations. They rely on Red Cross and Salvation Army and in the South, Southern Baptist men are going to solve my problem. And they're not gonna solve your problem. They're going to help you solve your problem. It sounds like a pretty good opportunity for uh, cross training, potentially, you know, amongst public sector employees. Cross training sounds good if you've done training, but we're having a hard enough time doing training. Right. So you, this is not the special forces. Fair enough. Okay, this is like infantry. Just shoot, shoot, move, and communicate. You can teach them three things, and you teach them those three things for twenty years. We're we're not getting into cross training. We have enough people cross-trained to drive snow plows. 
and oh, by the way, do this on their spare time and do this activity and also go through this training. We, we've got to understand that capacity has to increase, not just the internal capacity of one individual. We have to spread that across multiple individuals. I think that's a great point. Uh, when we're doing cross training or engaging someone who you know, is primarily a librarian or a letter carrier or, or, or something else, um, from the Red Cross perspective, we're often starting with, with our mission statement, you know, the, the foundational reason why we're doing this. And um, whether you're partnering with the Red Cross or not, if you are a local or a state government, um, you know, we, we really, as an organization, encourage you um, to, to remind uh, those people that will be working in a shelter um, that we're serving everyone. You know, uh, politics uh, don't exist right now during this emergency. Um, if someone is from the next county over, but they happen to be in a restaurant in our county, they are welcome in our shelter. Um, you know, th these are, you know, the, I think the Red Cross would say th these are generally pretty basic, uh, but I, I think we often see um, odd types of rules that, that are emerging amongst people that are, are operating or managing shelter sites, but because nobody underscored you know, what our mission is or why we're doing this. Um, and, and so I, I just want to, you know, take the moment to, to underscore that, you know, from the Red Cross perspective, everyone is welcome. And, and that doesn't just mean everyone is welcome in the door. It means we need to have the capability to serve everyone. And that goes back to the function and access needs uh, that, that it, it's really important that we prepare from a training perspective, uh, those people that, that may often not come face to face with the public to understand um, what to expect, um, that someone might need a little help filling out a form, that we might need to be patient, that we might need to, to pause and smile while they just take a moment to collect themselves uh, because they just went through a disaster. And one of the comments in the chat actually, I, I think goes to that, speaks to that as well, Alex, and you know, it was, uh, Alyssa Jackson Hill stated, you know, that we need to take into account the issues that local responders may have who have also been affected by the disaster, right? Which could potentially affect, you know, that, the, that trauma, you know, that can eventually affect uh, many issues as well. So, but I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, so we've got, we've got a lot of time for Q and A. Uh, Jessica, were you able to catch any, were you able to catch any questions that we were not able to address as part of the main, uh, as part of the main discussion? Um, one that they was talked about, but I think you guys kind of brushed on it, but didn't go into detail, but maybe do you have any suggestions for alternatives to stockpiling where some programs may not have that capability? Hey, Joe, I'm going to, I'm going to have you, uh, I'm going to have you field that first from the perspective of the availability of, uh, things like PPE and, med and basic medical supplies. Um, so for, for communities that may not have the either funds or uh, they may not have the funds or the resources necessarily to stockpile things like medical supplies, what are, what are some things that they can do to make sure that those resources are available when, when they might need them? Well, that's a great question and a huge challenge. Uh, you know, I, I think particularly related to PPE, those, those supply chains are better than they were certainly a year ago. Uh, and, and I don't know that I have a, a particular uh, special thing to, to, to recommend on that, except that uh, you need redundancy uh, in your supply chain. So, you know, part, part of what I've experienced in many times is uh, you respond to a city that's been hit by a hurricane, for example, and uh, every hospital is reaching out to the local supplier for uh, oxygen, water, power, et cetera. And of course, the one or two suppliers in town has a contract with every hospital in town and can, can respond to one of those, but not to all of those at the same time. And so we end up competing with each other for much needed resources. And so I think you have to you have to look at those kind of problems in terms of uh, the, the frequency with which one 
piece may go down, one hospital may go offline and need support, uh, in which case a local resource is probably capable of, of meeting your needs there, to a situation where the entire area is in need of resupply and uh, a realization that a local contractor, one, people may be affected, may not be able to come to work anyway, but that their, their supply chains are now down and you're going to have to reach to much larger, larger distances and much deeper into your um, resource, um, resources that are available as well as your pocketbook to be able to flow those resources into an area uh, in any kind of timely fashion at all. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's, I think that's important. Uh, the, the concept of redundancy, I think, is one that's just not discussed enough, but it's entirely necessary. Uh, Ryan, what, about, what are your thoughts on? Well, one, since this is a NEMA webinar, uh, we'll go back to the role of the state. Uh, state emergency management has, in, in all of the states, is phenomenal at answering resource requests from the local level. Um, many of the states, uh, I'll, I'll give North Carolina as an example, that has done a great job at it, um, have developed really phenomenal business operation centers where businesses and private sector entities come either virtually or in uh, reality, but usually virtually, to help answer those resource requests that are being flowed up to the state. So making sure that you have an access point to your county emergency management to get that to the state is absolutely crucial to answering your question. You want supplies? All supplies are available somewhere and they're all available for some price. So get that to the state, let the state help broker that for you um, and, and know your state requests. The other issue is contract overlaps. Um, Bay Area Urban Area Security Initiative based out of San Francisco uh, did a wonderful multi, I mean like book, of every single thing that they needed for disaster contracting and who all the other contractors were, and then identified all the, the single points of failure. You know, everybody has th this person on staff, uh, on call. The, everybody has this waste contractor. Everybody has this generator contract. Uh, from the Red Cross, uh, a little Red Cross story that during Hurricane Harvey, I, re I remember a, a story that, uh, they, they asked Minneapolis, hey, can you take 50,000 people? Every, uh, uh, or no, sorry, 5,000 people as evacuees. We're gonna fly them up here. Every one of the 10 counties said, we can take 500 people. So obviously we can take 5,000. Only problem, they were all using the same 500 beds from Red Cross and every one of them, no, none of them had ever figured out that everybody uses the exact same vendor the exact same provider. So those two things would be really good. Find your state resource uh, request process, learn it, learn how to leverage the state, especially if the state has a business operation center or a public private venture, um, and then understand who you're reliant on. If you're all reliant on the same gas provider, the same uh, generator provider, the same food provider, you've got to diversify. And the time to do that is in you know, prior to the emergency. Thanks, Ryan. We we had a great question in the uh, we had a great question in the chat, and it's actually one that that I you know I wanted the the, the my my goal for this panel was to direct uh, was to ultimately arrive at, at, at the answer that this question is is asking. And it, so it's that we've spent a lot of time today talking about current precautions as a result of the pandemic, but but what is it that we see uh, that anyone foresees uh, any of these changes or any of these mitigations that we're talking about becoming standard operating procedure post COVID? So Alex, I'm gonna kick that, I'm gonna kick that to you first. What, what are some of the things that we've discussed today? What are some of the things that the Red Cross is implementing as a result of, of the current pandemic that you see as likely to be a standard operating procedure moving forward? Yeah. I I think it's important to, I think, emphasize that um, it's not that we're doing that many things different, but, but that we're really prioritizing. So that coordination with our, our local and our state partners to talk about what, what capacity commitments we can make, 
what requests they think they're going to make of us and, and really understanding, you know, as an example, um, the operation of a screening area, if public health is available to do that, you know, we, we want them to be the primary operator of the screening area. Um, you know, knowing the public health departments and most of our, our local communities, like that, that isn't always going to happen. So we, we want to know that they're going to say no when we ask before we do. Um, so I, I think the, the coordination, particularly with, with public health departments, um, as well as emergency management agencies is, is, is really important. Um, and, I, you know, Non-congregate sheltering um, is our primary approach right now because it's the safest way to do it. Um, I, I, I'm not the, the senior decision maker for our organization, so no one here should quote me, but I, I don't think we will continue delivering sheltering at hotels when it's safe to operate congregate shelters again. That said, you know, before coronavirus existed, um, norovirus was occurring in, in some of our disaster shelters. And there, there certainly have been other infectious diseases where many of the protocols that we're, that we're following now needed to exist. Um, but I, I think um, this is a great opportunity for us as an organization and, and for us as a whole of community um, to really recognize and appreciate how important simple things like hand washing stations are and having hand sanitizer everywhere when you're congregating lots of people. Um, so, you know, if, if I had a magic wand, it, it probably would just be um, the, the maintenance of the, the overabundance of, of supplies like that where we're operating. Uh, Dr. Holly, from an emergency medical, uh, emergency medical perspective, what do you see, uh, what have you seen that's changed over, uh, as a result of COVID and what do you see most likely becoming uh, standard operating procedure moving forward? Well, everything's changed. Uh, but, I, but I think Alex touched on it really nicely. And, and that is we, we've, we've now incorporated in a much more robust fashion, significant improvements, changes and alterations to our infrastructure, uh, both in screening people prior to responding to a, a disaster to uh, contact tracing and prevention and protection on the other end once we're in theater and working. And, and the realization that many of the survivors that we're going to interact with um, may be at high risk for COVID. They're in um, nursing homes or, you know, group homes, that kind of stuff where spread is much easier. So I, I think it's, it's the the protection piece of that and an awareness level of how we now alter our approach uh, to those entities so that we at least do so with uh, in a mindful way uh, to reduce the chance of uh, spread of infection, um, you know, new, organi new organisms appearing uh, and, and then taking what may be a relatively small problem, w one ill person in a, a group home, for example, and moving that problem someplace else and allowing it to spread uh, in the new location, therefore resulting in orders of magnitude, more complications, problems, infrastructure, work, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think it's a bit of a... a uh, incorporation into the infrastructure on approach, mindfulness, and protection. Thanks a lot, Ryan. What do you What do you see becoming uh, standard operating procedure? Potentially becoming standard operating procedure from a from base camp from base camp and just kind of general service ops. Uh, well, we see definitely a move towards hard sided structures. Um, it, it's just keeps gaining popularity despite availability. Um, and so we, we see that in subdividing structures, um, both becoming more consistent and more common than just using congregate tents uh, for all the activities. Uh, technology integration continues to move regardless. Yes, we leverage it for the pandemic, but I would argue that it's just a nature of the business that we're in people want what they're comfortable with and they're, they're comfortable with Netflix streaming. 
And that is very difficult um, when cellular capacity is, you know, limited or gone and you're moving to satellite like Starlink, which to be fair is going to radically transform or potentially radically transform the satellite market to where we can provide higher capacity bandwidth than we've ever been able to do on off-grid. Um, and then I see just more integration of public health to go with both Alex and, and, and Joe, I'd say we're seeing more need to just take public health into consideration, whether that's more frequent cleaning, different janitorial, um, better uh, subdivision of the structures, uh, better screening, contact tracing, all of those things are going into, people are starting to realize that diseases matter and that, that we need to therefore change our, our perspective. So I'd say that, that though that is the current pandemic, um, we have virtually eliminated flu as a massive, as a major issue because we're taking stronger precautions for uh, COVID-19. Well, don't we wanna continue on that track? In, in certain environments. So uh, I'd say those are the three that we're going to continue to see push. And just because I, I personally preach it, I really think the community pre preparedness is starting to gain some footholds where it's, it's not just condemned that you're a prepper, uh, but that you're actually just being prepared. Uh, I think more people are thinking about their medical needs, especially their uh, electro electrical needs than ever before. I, I, I think especially things like what happened in Texas, Mississippi and, and Virginia and elsewhere during uh, Winter Storm Uri really is driving home to a large percentage of the population that preparedness is their responsibility. I, I for one, I will not, I did not miss the flu this year. So that's, you know, that's me. Uh, I'm sure that there are some people out there that, that missed it, but uh, I was not one of them. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I think, you know, when you talk about subdividing the subdivision of structures and, and you know, mentioning, you know, keeping people separate, being able to isolate folks and, and conduct the, you know, provide the necessary services that you need while, you know, conducting those screenings. You know, I think that, you know, one of the things that we see uh, from, from Harbor's perspective and, and the design of the modular roof system was, was that that that's going to be a need, you know, that's going to be a need moving forward, being able to provide that as a have at the community preparedness level, right? Like, or whether it's, you know, whether it's a local community, whether it's regional, whether, you know, county or whether it's state, having resources available that, that, that uh, the communities and organizations can fall on when they need them and having those available. So there isn't that mad dash and that competition. Uh, I think that's going to be critical moving forward. And I'm, you know, uh, Personally and professionally, I'm I'm looking forward to to that to that more strategic focus and that preparedness focus uh, at both the national level and the state levels. And so, you know, I think we're we're looking forward to being a part of the solution and working with those organizations on those on those being a part of those strategic solutions as well. So, uh, Alex, I'm going to pitch this over to you, and then I think Joe, you may have a few things to say about this. So the question is. Uh, have there been challenges implementing hand hygiene programs in your shelters? And if so, well, what have those been? Um, I mean, I, I can speak from personal experience before uh, this, this recent disaster season, but, you know, in a, a shelter, I think this, this was in, uh, this was following the campfire in Paradise, California. Uh, there, there were a lot of survivors that, that were all staying at the same location and there was norovirus and, um, you know, lots of hand washing stations were brought in, you know, uh, the Red Cross was working very closely with the state and the county. Um, you know, there, there was, there was not a question of available resources. Um, and people still just walked right past the, the hand washing station. Um, and, and so, you know, from a challenge perspective, it, it's mostly about behavior, um, helping people understand and appreciate, um, but, but also, you know, changing certain, certain ways that we do our business. If anyone's ever been on a cruise, and I'm not sure how many of us will uh, in the future, but, um, you know, I, the one time I went on a cruise, you know, to, as you're walking into the dining hall, you know, there's someone standing there 
ready to put hand sanitizer on your hand and they're smiling at you um, and they're talking to you and they, they go out of their way to do that. Um, you know, that um, th there's always going to be challenges with people either not understanding or just um, some people are, are having a challenging day um, and, and may want to take it out on someone who's trying to seemingly be helpful. Uh, but, you know, I think certainly the way that we um, strive to mitigate is making sure that there's enough hand washing stations in the first place and that there is signage reminding people why. Um, you know, things that in a congregate shelter setting, you know, not just for this reason, but for many reasons, having, you know, one or two daily meetings and telling everyone what's going on and why can go a very far way um, to addressing this type of challenge or any other challenge. Um, and, you know, much like in our own community, when, when we have friendly neighbors, we're, we're, we're more friendly to, to everyone else around us. Um, you know, I, I think it, it can go a long way for this type of challenge to smile when we're washing our hands. And, you know, as a, as a service provider, you know, being a model and doing it a lot and talking to other people and, and, and just being an example. Um, I, I think, you know, even with everything I've just said and, and you know, having unlimited resources, we're, we're, we're still going to have challenges. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I think we'll, we'll be safer because we're, we're reaching nearly everyone. Joe, uh, last thoughts on, uh, on hand washing and uh, getting, folks, getting folks to do it. Sure. Well, uh, uh, Alex said it beautiful. I'll just say ditto in many ways, right? It, it, it very much, I think, is availability, uh, setting an example, uh, making it as easy and uh, sort of seamless as you possibly can. You know, everything from uh, tying the uh, uh, little bottle of hand sanitizer pump thing to the the door of the porta john, so that you have to, you know, it's right there. You got to touch it to open the door. Uh, will help people remember that they need to do that. So uh, I, I think Alex touched on all that beautifully. It really is. Uh, sort of setting habits in many cases, expectations and examples. Uh, so we are coming really close to time. Uh, I will, I give everybody one minute for final thoughts. If you have anything that you wanted to say today, but didn't get the chance that you didn't get the chance to say, Ryan, we'll start with you. Well, forget flying cars. We can't even, we're still teaching people how to wash hands in 2020. Um, I, I think that, you know, we've, we've suffered through a, a real national level emergency. And I, I've had that discussion with FEMA, I've had that discussion with states that most of our plans relied on mutual aid. It relied on somebody was gonna to come to our rescue. And I will say the same thing that I've said for 25 years now as a emergency management director, no one is coming. It is up to you to figure out how you take care of yourself and the people you're responsible for. Now, we'll, we'll eventually get there in some places, but we just, you want that kind of response. You're going to need to build that capacity local and not be completely reliant on mutual aid. Thanks, Ryan. Alex, what are your uh, final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, I appreciate this opportunity again. Thank you for, for having the Red Cross here. Um, I mean, the, the mission of the Red Cross is to ameliorate human suffering in the face of an emergency or disaster. And COVID-19 doesn't change our mission. It's just changing how we do it. Um, and we, we've adapted a lot of tactics and training and procedures um, that are really trying to balance the, the mission delivery with the priority for our, our workforce safety, our health, the well-being of everyone we're serving. Um, and I think we, we really welcome the opportunity to, to partner with, with all of the other agencies, um, and, and we strive to be a good partner. And, and I'll just end with um, a, a lot of our guidance that, that um, is really the foundation of everything I'm talking about is available on a website. Uh, it's called the National Mass Care Strategy. If you just type that into Google um, or nationalmasscarestrategy.org, um, you can download you know, our, our newest published standards, and um, our training is on YouTube. And um, again, you know, connect with the, the local or state uh, Red Cross partners, and, and we, we do want to serve alongside you. Dr. Joe, any final thoughts? 
Well, I think it's, you know, preparation and training are the key. Uh, it, 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 it is not easy. It is not inexpensive to do the preparation and the training, but it pays for itself in the long run. Uh, and you won't be sorry if you make the investment. So you just got to step up and be prepared, be trained and be ready to go. And that, and that's going to bring us, uh, that's going to bring us right to time. Sam, I, I see you and it's, you know, uh, they look, I don't think there's anybody here that doesn't understand the nature of uh, the technical difficulties of the, the age that we live in. So, Hey, absolutely no worries. Um, we will definitely, uh, hopefully we will have the opportunity to, uh, to, to do something like this again, Jessica, we, we, really happy to be have the opportunity to bring this panel together and, and have such a great discussion. Uh, just real quickly, uh, on behalf of Harbor and myself, uh, thank you so much to Nima for the opportunity to bring these folks together. And to our panelists, uh, Ryan Broden from Deployed Resources, Alex Rose from the Red Cross, Dr. Joe Hawley, uh, from uh, from so many different organizations that I, I can't actually list them all without my without my uh, without my notes. And then and Sam, I'm so sorry that we had uh, that we had technical difficulties, but uh, Everybody, thank you so much. Jessica, I, I relinquish the floor to you. Thank you. Um, this was a, I knew it would be a stellar panel and it was a great uh, discussion. So thank you all for your time. Um, and just a reminder, everyone, we do have our networking lounge. It starts at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So we will see you all then. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody.